Hello and welcome to the Political Opinions Podcast, where every opinion is given equal footing and political tolerance and debate are given their proper attention in a world where both are on the decline. Today's episode will go over the different opinions on unelected legislative chambers. The House of Lords is one of the most integral aspects of UK democracy, given that it has a high degree of power to scrutinise the actions of the UK government and House of Commons. It is also one of the most controversial aspects of UK democracy, given that none of its members are elected, and as such, none of them are accountable to the public or legitimised by the public. This has led to calls by some people, most notably the Liberal Democrats, to replace it with an elected chamber. This episode will use the UK's House of Lords for context, but these views can easily be applied to other democratic systems. The aim of this episode will not be to try and argue for or against an elected chamber, but rather to showcase the different opinions and provide a comparison between them. I will begin with the arguments opposed to an elected chamber, followed by the arguments in favour, with a comparison at the end. One of the benefits of an unelected chamber is that it allows for people with specialist knowledge to be appointed. This is very critical for a chamber whose primary role is scrutinising the actions and legislation of the government. An appointed chamber allows people with expertise in certain areas, such as businessmen, medical experts and more, to be in a position to provide specialist knowledge to the chamber. For example, a former doctor is arguably better at scrutinising reform to the NHS than a generic politician. Another benefit of an elected chamber is that it is inferior to the elected chamber. This prevents legislative gridlock, such as is common in the US Congress, where the Republican-dominated Senate and Democrat-dominated House of Representatives, at the moment at least, often engage in parliamentary ping-pong, where both chambers continually reject and amend legislation from the other side, preventing anything really getting done. An appointed chamber, therefore, would have to bow to the superior elected one and allow the legislative body of government to operate more efficiently. An unelected chamber is is also not going to be filled with many party loyalists. For example, in the UK House of Lords, there are 181 crossbench peers, which means the decisions are less likely to be influenced by party loyalty. And furthermore, given peers cannot be removed by their party, they can consistently vote against them if they so wish, unlike MPs who constantly have the fear of the, par- of the party whip being removed from them if they vote against them. An unelected second chamber also allows the chamber to specialise in a more specific role. In the House of Lords case, this is scrutiny and only with rare exception the creation of legislation. Two elected chambers trying to do the same thing could cause more harm than good, as it would often be unclear who is trying to do what. If they are both making legislation, unless there are very, very clear boundaries as to who's doing what, it can cause many complications, such as, again, is common in the US Congress. Finally, an argument can be made that an appointed peerage can allow for certain quotas. While it is not necessarily achieved in the House of Lords at the moment, it means that if proper means are put in place through the appointing process, it can allow for descriptive representation. If the body were elected, this would be much harder to do than simply appointing people of certain ethnicities, races, professions, etc. Moving on now to the arguments in favour of an elected second chamber. Firstly, and the most important argument, is that it is simply undemocratic for a legislative body of government to be unelected. The House of Lords is in no way accountable to the electorate, and as such, they exercise an undemocratic power of legislation and scrutiny. Having elected peers would therefore make the House more accountable and democratic, and some would say that it is actually hypocratic to say we live in a democracy when one of the most important bodies of government is undemocratic in the most extreme form possible. There would also be wider representation if the House of Lords was elected. Currently, the only representation for voters is their MP, which, due to first past the post being of questionable integrity, is often not their preferred choice. All you have to do is look at the fact that no government since pre-World War II has had more than 50% of the vote. And therefore, an elected second chamber would allow more representation to be provided to voters. Furthermore, an elected body would have more power to actually influence the government and the House of Commons. Unelected peers cannot stop House of Commons bills. I believe they can only delay them for about up to a year, given the reasonable time convention. But beyond that, their, degree, their true degree of scrutiny is limited 
An elected body, however, could fulfil this function far more effectively, allowing for better scrutiny and, as a result, better legislation, given that they can force the other body, the House, to change their bill and not to simply reject it, which is often the case. Often, the House of Lords will reject a bill and propose amendments, and especially a government with a strong majority, such as the case at the moment, can simply bypass them. And ultimately, that true degree of scrutiny is very limited at times. An elected House of Lords would also reduce executive dominance of Parliament by adding another power beyond the government-dominated House of Commons. There is a term known as elective dictatorship, whereby given that the government controls the House of Commons, there is ultimately no true scrutiny being placed upon them. And even though there are often their flaws and mistakes are pointed out, no action can be taken because they control the legislative body. But having another elected body would allow this elective dictatorship to be greatly reduced, if not eliminated entirely. And finally, the appointment system is flawed in the UK especially, and often results in party loyalists being appointed to peerage rather than people who are actually specialists. The main criticism is aimed at the Conservative Party, who are often accused of appointing to peerage those who have donated a lot to the party and have been helpful rather than those who actually specialise. And many parties may be reluctant to try and appoint peers who they know would consistently vote against them, even if they have the most expertise in their relevant field. Moving on now to the comparison, on the idea of legislative efficiency, those favouring an unelected body would rather have more specialised scrutiny coming from experts in specific fields, while those favouring an elected body would rather have more forceful scrutiny from a a legitimate and elected house. So it comes down to how much you want the scrutiny to actually have an impact compared to how much you want the scrutiny itself to be specialised and provide more expertise behind it. Then on legislative speed, an unelected argument would follow that it is better to have an appointed House of Lords, given that it allows for less gridlock by the second chamber being less powerful and they would essentially say that its speed is very important it's important the government and that the house of commons can get bills out quickly and an elected upper chamber would simply reduce this by causing parliamentary ping pongs again such as in the usa on the other side however they would argue that having an unelected body prevents proper scrutiny as commons bills can simply pass through given a point of time and they would say that it is more important that even if bills are slower, it'd be more important to have more effective and properly scrutinised bills, and that if bills need to be rushed through, then they would have to argue in this case, essentially, that the other chamber would not just be parochial, essentially, and trying to stop the legislation just because they are able to. On the idea of party loyalists, Those who favour unelected bodies would argue that there are more cross-bench peers, and given peers can't be removed, they don't have to follow their own party. And all of this means that the House of Lords especially is an extremely unpartisan chamber compared to the House of Commons, which is extremely partisan. And as such, it allows legislation to be scrutinised, not from a party standpoint, but from an individual standpoint, given they have their own expertise. Well, those on the other side would say that most appointees are party loyalists anyway, and they are most likely going to favour their party, especially if they've been appointed simply because they've donated lots of money. And as such, the true extent to this individualised scrutiny is going to be very limited. In regards to power over the government, those favouring an unelected body would say this is bad, as it prevents the government from acting efficiently efficiently, given that it slows down the entire process and can cause confusion over where sovereignty lies. While those on the other side would say that an elected body is good as it reduces elective dictatorship and prevents total government domination of parliament. Finally, on the idea of legitimacy, those opposing an elected body would say that legitimacy is not that important given the second chamber is less powerful and can't stop the commons. And they would argue that the benefits of having a legitimate body and a democratic body is outweighed by the costs that come through having this. While those on the other side would say that legitimacy is very important and it is ultimately undemocratic to have an elected body of the legislative. Overall, those in favour of an elected upper chamber tend to argue for it on the basis of legitimacy and in the UK case, the failure of the appointment system. Those opposing it, however, 
tend to prefer a chamber with more expertise and are happy for it to be undemocratic, given that it is less powerful than the other chamber. This debate will definitely continue unless, until more definitive action is taken to properly define the role of the House of Lords after New Labour's unfinished reforms. Until then, the House of Lords will continue to operate as an unelected and less powerful chamber whose role is limited to words-only scrutiny of an elected dictatorship. What are your thoughts on this issue? Is there anything I missed? Anything I got wrong? Anything I could do better? Let me know on Twitter or in the comments. And be sure to check back on Friday for the different opinions on the preliminary outcome of the US presidential election, depending on what happens tomorrow, Tuesday, for those who are listening on a different day. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you all soon.